Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Alexandra Vuduri, a journalist, and I'm honored to chair this online conference co-organized by Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Athens and Elia Mep, the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, with a quite interesting title, The Future of Energy Security for the Eastern Mediterranean. The region of the East Med has become the eye of a gathering geopolitical storm and rather hot issue in Greece's domestic agenda. But I must admit that related issues and the recent crisis are usually seen by the Greek media and thus by the public solely from our own perspective. But current developments obviously could not be seen only through one perspective only since the East Med and particularly the issue of energy security and future solutions involves all countries in the region with no exclusion. Moreover, under certain conditions, it also involves many third parties, I could say, and their own multiple interests as well. So I would like to thank both Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and Elia Mek for this initiative to give our audience tonight the opportunity to hear as many views as possible and the future, of course, perspectives of such a timely topic. But first, I would like to give the floor to both Mr. Henri Bonnet, the head of Casa de Nauer Stiftung, and Professor George Pagulatos, the head of Elia Mep, for their welcoming remarks. Mr. Bonnet, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, Alexandra. Kalispera, good evening and welcome. I'm very happy that today it is the pleasure of us, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, to cooperate with Ilya Map on this important topic. And I think it comes at the right time. Right now, European leaders are sitting in Brussels talking about issues which we also want to touch today, and especially two issues which also concern us today. This is not only the role of Turkey in the Mediterranean, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and possible sanctions, but maybe even more importantly, it's also about energy security and sustainability for the future. In the face of the current Corona crisis, we are becoming more and more aware of avoiding maybe also the next, even more possibly bigger crisis, the climate change. But as with COVID-19, all of us have realized, I think, that cooperation is the key, not confrontation. We need open communication and exchange of information, not accusations and not provocations. That's why we're here today to exchange expert views from in and outside of Greece, to come up with recommendations and proposals for positive change in the geopolitics of this region. And in finding new solutions for energy security in our countries. Let me remind, let me remind you that the Konrad Adenauer Foundation is a German organization and think tank close to the CDU of Angela Merkel, active, we are already for eight years in Greece, and Cyprus to enhance the dialogue between our countries and to find solutions to our common challenges. Let's hope that we will manage to do that also a little bit today. I want to thank all speakers for coming and tuning in from Germany, from everywhere else, and Greece especially. I want to thank Elia Map for the partnership, which has proven again to be very good. Especially I want to thank Yorgos Dobopoulos. Together we came up with this idea and I wanted to thank my colleague Lefteris, who made this, uh, turned this idea into reality together with Ilya Map. And already in advance, I want to thank our interpreters so that everybody can understand us. I wish us all a very good discussion and hand over again to Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonnet. And now I'm giving the floor to Professor George Pagulatos for his introductory remark. Professor. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Henry. It's a great pleasure to co-organize this event together. We've shared a, a long partnership with the Kodna Dadnar Stiftung. Uh, for many years, we've been uh, organizing discussions, bilateral discussions between uh, Greek and German scholars and experts. Um, in fact, the, the background for this event uh, probably started in early March 2020 with the visit of the Greek Prime Minister in Berlin where he met with Chancellor Merkel, inaugurated uh, Greek-German cooperation on green energy transition. A part of it is the uh, Volkswagen initiative today in Astipale and other initiatives on the way. Um, and given this and given the ambitious targets set by Greece in terms of green energy, in terms of transition to renewables, we consider this an opportunity to also launch a bilateral dialogue uh, between our think tanks um, in order to better approach the question of new energy solutions. 
And of course, talking about energy, this is an area that cross cuts between different fields. Um, it's one of the fastest developing uh, policy areas exactly because of its dynamic and having to do with a single market, with development, with transition to green growth and sustainability, but also with security. Um, and hence the dimension of energy security. And of course, in our part of the region, energy security and, and security in general in Eastern Mediterranean is uh, a matter of great uh, concern, a great challenge, as uh, Henry has mentioned. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here, our two expert panels of excellent uh, experts from uh, Greece and Germany uh, and beyond. And um, I look forward to the discussion that will follow. And I pass the floor back to Alexandra to coordinate the discussion. Thanks again. Thank you, Professor Pavlatos. Now, our first panel discussion uh, will be focusing on the geopolitics of energy in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we have here with us three distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Mikhail Tanchum from Universidad de Navarra, a senior associate fellow at the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy in Vienna, uh, Ms. Kirsten Westphal, uh, a senior analyst at the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin, and Mr. Ephthimios Papastavridis, a research associate at Iliamet, researcher and part-time lecturer at the Oxford University, research fellow at the Academy of Athens and Athens PIL Center. So our speakers will give firstly an introductory statement and then they will receive some questions. I would like uh, to firstly welcome Professor Tanchum. The floor is yours, Professor. Good evening from Athens. Ah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, uh, the Greece and Cyprus office, and Elia Mep for having me to this event. And uh, since we're on the topic of uh, geopolitics in the East Med, I'd like to point out I just edited uh, a volume by uh, published by the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. If you could see it, it's called In Unchartered Waters. If you, uh, if you look up Eastern Mediterranean in uncharted waters, you could find it uh, on the internet. It's a great one volume policy guide to the Eastern Mediterranean with 10 experts. All right, so what I'd like to do is give the, the geopolitical picture of energy, uh, as uh, Alexandra said. Uh, many of us in the Eastern Mediterranean know that most of us think the whole world revolves around the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, now with everybody paying attention to the Eastern Mediterranean, that just reinforces that. But the Eastern Mediterranean crisis, which is mainly now three interlinked crises, uh, the Cyprus problem, the Greece-Turkey maritime boundary dispute, and the Libya crisis, the civil war, uh, are part of a Mediterranean system. And that's the real geopolitics we have to understand, uh, that the Mediterranean as a whole functions as a system, and there are four players. The Mediterranean is a game of four. The four largest countries in order, Egypt, Turkey, France, Italy. These four countries by themselves are over 50% of the Mediterranean basin's population. They're the four largest armies. And so the main fault line uh, in this geopolitical uh, competition is the partnership between France and Egypt to block Turkey's expanding influence in Africa, which is a big concern for France, as well as Egypt, and in the Middle East. Now, this partnership has been joined by the uh, United Arab Emirates. So in that sense, the action of these players in the Eastern Mediterranean is a part of this greater struggle. And that's important when for Greece, when Greece wants to understand what are they going to do? Now I said there were four, right? The wild card in this whole equation is Italy. Um, now, and that's what I would like to speak about a little bit and talk about how this all, how do these four players, Greece, Cyprus, uh, and others fit into this uh, struggle? Well, I, uh, Italy, when we speak about Italy, we have to speak about the energy company ENI, which everyone knows is the main player in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, ENI is the largest company in Italy, not just the largest energy company, 
the largest company, and it is de facto run by the Italian government. I'm not making that up. It says so right on Eni's website. You can read it. So we all know that Eni is the lead operator in Cyprus, but for Eni's point of view, more importantly, they're the lead operator in the massive Zor field, which was discovered in 2015, uh, which made Eastern Mediterranean marketable, the Eastern Mediterranean natural gas marketable. And Eni also can, uh, ha owns 50% in one of the two LNG plants in Egypt. So as soon as Zor was discovered, Eni came up with a plan to market, to put Egyptian gas, Cypriot gas, and Israeli gas all together, and any others that would later become available, send them all to Egypt, and then market them as LNG. This made sense for any since, uh, and it made commercial sense. But a big problem is it left Turkey totally out of the picture, like a geopolitical time bomb. Uh, Turkey had built a massive pipeline infrastructure, especially even uh, the Tanap pipeline across Turkey, uh, and none of the, and, and has its own ambitions to send gas. So all of that would be made null and void be through this marketing scheme. So we get to 2018, the second discovery in Cyprus, the Calypso discovery, uh, made Cyprus a player. Now, of course, the uh, Glaucos really makes Cyprus a player. But as soon as that uh, discovery was made, any was sending a drill ship to uh, in the same um, licensing block, and the Turkish Navy, uh, Turkey sent its navy to block the any ship, and drove it off. This is when Turkey's gunboat diplomacy started. Uh, Turkey was trying to send a message from its point of view. Uh, it had the opposite outcome. It it drove uh, Italy closer to Cyprus. And it brought France into the picture because to mitigate its risks, any uh, opened up all its licensing blocks to the French giant Total. Uh, and that gave France a kind of foot in the Eastern Mediterranean. From Total's point of view and France's point of view, uh, their stake in Eastern Mediterranean gas is not worth anything. For, compared to what they're doing in the Eastern Mediterranean, it just gave them a way to enter this, this uh, uh, the, uh, to oppose Turkey. Now, but from Eni's point of view, this is why I want to leave, it's not just Cyprus or Egypt. In the Mediterranean, Algeria and Libya are Eni's big, big concerns. Any controls 45% of all of Libya's oil and gas. So this is why the connections are very important. 45%. All of Libya's natural gas is exported to Italy. All of it, exclusively. So uh, that's 8% of Italy's consumption. Now, every field, every all of that infrastructure of oil and gas in Libya, except for one field, is in Western Libya under the control of the government of national accord, which is supported by Turkey. So Italy in this whole game was always loosely, always compartmentalized the East Med in its struggle with Turkey because it wasn't worth as much to them and played ball with Turkey because of the value of Libya. And we could add uh, Algeria in there too. Algeria supplies 21% of Italy's natural gas. Now, Turkey is chain, uh, Turkey's intervention in Libya has changed Italy's perspective. How much? We don't know. But there's also $52 billion worth of contracts for reconstruction in Libya. Italy wants part of that. Turkey wants part of it. Even Spain expects $12 billion of it. So this is, this is where Italy's decisions about the Eastern Mediterranean really are in many ways located in Libya. And so it's important to understand all these connections. If Turkey presses too much in Libya, the Italians will be less inclined to Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, they, before 
with Haftar's, uh, the civil war and Haftar's assault on Tripoli, there was so much chaos uh, that a lot of Eni's uh, oil fields, which were in the border areas, uh, were, were shut down. The gas never was shut down because the GNA protected it. So, um, so they were in the beginning glad to stop Haftar's assault. And this is the difference between France and Tur uh, Italy. But now with Turkey's big, big uh, presence there, uh, Italy is worried. So, uh, and now it really, and Italy has been developing its relations with Egypt. And so the big question on Italy is, is how close they're gonna be to France. Uh, and that depends how much France will give parity to Italy in their relationship. All of this is going on behind the decision. Positive signs in that regard is that Italy sent troops to Mali to help France fight against the jihadists. That was a very significant move for Italy. So to wrap this up, uh, and the same with uh, Spain. Spain, in, in, in this, there's the, the bank issue that Spain has $63 billion worth of bank exposure to Turkish debt, and so would lose a lot if there were sanctions. But also Spain's oil field, Reps, uh, uh, their company Repsol has the Sharara oil field, which is Repsol's most profitable operation, again, in GNA territory. So you have to understand how all, all of these are linked. Uh, I have my own proposal for the Eastern Mediterranean energy, but I think my time is about expired. Is that right, Alexandra? So I would save that for uh, questions and answers, but I wanted to lay out the complexity because if it was just a matter of business, businessmen would take care of it. If there was no politics, economists, we would just be having a lecture here by scientists and economists, but it's not. It's about power, not just in the energy sense, but in the political sense. So I'll leave it there and set the table Professor, for the rest thank of the conference. Thank you so much. You're giving us the whole picture of the state of play currently taking place in the East Med. And perhaps for our viewers, you gave um, exactly what is going on and what, and you could uh, definitely explain the, the positions of uh, the member states, especially during uh, tonight's European Council. And congratulations for your report published just by Conrad Adenauer Stifting in Turkey. So I'm turning now to Ms. Kirsten Westphal for her introdu introductory uh, remarks. Uh, Ms. Westphal, good evening from Athens. Thank you very much and it's a pleasure to join. Thank you also for the invitation and it's also a special pleasure to follow after Professor Michael Tantium. Great to see you, Michael. And I, I knew already that Michael would give a very broad and excellent picture on the Mediterranean. I'm coming now from more the the angle of Northwestern Europe and Germany. So kind of uh, geographically um, um, from a distance. Um, and I would like to make the point that what we are seeing besides the power shifts is also a paradigm shift from tradi traditional energy geopolitics that are linked to national energy supply security to more um, integrated energy climate and sustainability approaches and thus more to the geopolitics of the energy transformation and then we have different dynamics. So let me start with my first point that traditionally Germany, Northwestern European gas markets look to South, Southeast Europe, look to Turkey and to the East Met as regions to diversify its gas resources, its gas transport routes. And Michael has already pointed to Turkey playing a major role in there with the TANAP and the TAP link um, and possibly linking not only the Caspian region, but also Iraq, Iran and East Met um, resources to Europe and Northwestern European markets. And this was um, the view in the early 2020s and many political narratives still persist in this direction. But the point that I would like to make is that market realities are very different now. 
we really have to see that the political rhetorics detach from the market realities. And I would like to present three hypotheses. The EU, uh, from my point of view, will not provide a market for gas from the East Met. And this also means that the East Met pipeline will be uh, in the political rhetorical sphere, but is not providing a business case. And the reason is that um, Europe's gas demand forecast is stable in the years up to 2025. Um, even despite of the fact that in the Northwestern European markets, we seeing a phase out of over 50 gigawatt of nuclear coal and lignite fired capacity, which of course in the short term allows for higher gas fired generation. But this is really a, a story of short term games and we will see more and have to see actually more expansion of renewables um, coming in. Moreover, the EU in the current situation has vast access to LNG and pipeline gas, not only from the Mediterranean, but also from the US, Russia, Qatar, and so on. And we have capacities of 227 BCM LNG, which equals 40% um, of consumption plus the pipeline gas. So this is why um, this no longer is in the past, the EU is not really a market for East Mediterranean gas. And this is a spe specifically an issue, of course, for the future of Cyprus gas reserves. And what comes on top of this, it is that the global market also is amply supplied until mid 2020. And this is also why the current world energy outlook sees no way for the relative expensive gas um, of the East Med to come to production of, certainly I'm talking about those fields that, that are not producing yet. Um, and what comes also on top of, top of this is that COVID-19, of course, meant a dash for demand um, um, globally. So we have, will have a prolonged phase of slowly um, um, narrowing markets. And of course, COVID-19 also had an impact on the oil and gas majors. They have cut into their investments and also shifted to renewables. And this is the second point that I would like to make, and these, these points are briefer. Um, the Green Deal has yet to be translated um, in the EU into energy policies, especially for the region we are looking to, Greece, Southeastern Europe, um, Cyprus. So if we look beyond 2025, and we assume that um, the European Council today, tomorrow, will decide on climate neutrality and minus 55% to 2030, then, of course, the East Met gas pipeline does not not only have a business case, but is also an antagonism stemming from a different age. Um, because we're seeing that the Green Deal and the recovery program for the next generation, of course, wants to spend 750 billion euro, uh, but of which 40% will be directed to climate and biodiversity. Diversity, and gas projects may only include it if they do not significant harm. So and this point is very critical because Actually, it, include, um, it excludes gas-fired power plants, but allows for co-generation of power and district heating. So, so there will be less money available for these projects. So what we're looking into in the future is really, and I think the second panel will touch on this, is energy efficiency, electrification playing a major role, low carbon, carbon neutral molecules like hydrogen. Um, and this, this is really a point where, where, where we're already seeing the dynamics changing. Why am I saying that? Then this is my third point. There is an issue of regional integration and fragmentation in EU energy markets themselves due to shifting energy geographies. Um, so we are seeing both. We are seeing a kind of regional core region in northwestern European um, energy markets moving quickly towards um, decarbonization, looking into a backbone projects of hydrogen. But we have still um, a region in southeast European markets um, 
but also beyond, which is still looking into a gas um, as a way to decarbonize quickly or at least to, to cut emissions quickly. Um, so we have an issue of center and periphery um, and we see in the so-called peripheries still growing gas markets. Um, it, it may sound odd that I'm talking about peripheries, but just think about the synchronized electricity grid, which is the continental electricity grid of NSOE. And we have still less or not interconnected um, um, islands in particular like um, Cyprus where we still have an issue to interconnect so this is why I'm talking to um, um, about periphery and centers and my point is that we will see more interconnection of course and we'll see more energy regionalization but the driver will not be natural gas but rather uh, electrons, green electrons and green molecules. So there is a new dynamic um, in the Mediterranean region, which we looked from, especially from Berlin, from Brussels, as one major region where, where Europe has a, a solid influence. If you think about the Barcelona process, if you think about the Union for the Mediterranean and all these institutions, but these are no longer, let's say, up to date. We are really seeing, and, and Michael perfectly um, painted the picture, we are seeing um, a loss of influence um, of the European Union. We see other middle powers coming in, like Turkey, the UAE. We also see um, European countries playing a major role. So the point is really, um, um, the Europe is no longer the, um, a major demand center for natural gas. Um, and we are also, for example, seeing an East Med gas forum being constituted, but this does not reflect the major demand vectors. If you look for um, where are the demand centers for natural gas, um, it would be Turkey, for example. So um, this is my final point, really, what is a challenge for the EU is exactly not that much the, the shifting of energy geographies, but these geographies playing into the, the conflict lines and the conflicts that, that Michael described and putting on that more dynamics. So it's also an issue for EU integration, for EU sphere of influence in East Met vis-a-vis -vis third powers like Russia, China, the UAA, UAE. And we will also have to see final sentence how US and EU, so to say, the influence of the West plays out in the future. Yeah, Ms. Bethel, thank you so much for your remarks. Great remarks for uh, and a great introduction for our discussion. Now we're moving on to Mr. Ethimios Papastavridis uh, for your introductory remarks. Please be as brief as possible because uh, we're running a little bit out of time. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, uh, Ms. Wuduri, uh, and many, many thanks to uh, the both the institutes that have kindly invited me, uh, Coronel Adenauer and uh, Elia Mep. Um, I'm, I'm the only lawyer in the panel, so I, I'm, I'm, uh, I apologize for, I will give you some provision, some uh, lawyer's stuff, and maybe some very black letter law analysis of, uh, of the, the mapping out of the Mediterranean Sea. So what we hear about green energy, we hear about uh, oil, you know, uh, oil and gas uh, fields. Uh, when it comes to the sea, uh, we need to take also law very seriously, law into consideration. And what I'm going to do in, uh, in the next uh, seven or six minutes is try to very briefly say a few sentences, firstly, on how is the, uh, the, uh, the play, uh, the state of affairs in terms of maritime delimitation in the area. Secondly, what states can or cannot do pending the limitation of these maritime areas. And thirdly, what is the, uh, the legal um, landscape with respect to laying somewhere in cables on pipeline this the material sea. Now, uh, I'm, I'm afraid that we know if we are going to, if we want to have um, uh, offshore installation, wind farms, uh, um, other uh, energy installations in the Mediterranean Sea, off our territorial sea, beyond our 12 nautical miles or six nautical miles uh, regarding Greece, we need to delimit, and we need to delimit, what I say, delimit maritime areas. 
and uh, in, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, we had very recently a couple of free maritime delimitation, including the Turkish Libya Accord. Uh, however, we are very far away from um, you know uh, the uh, a whole set of of, uh, of treaties uh, delimiting our maritime areas. And, and the limitation is, is, is necessary because otherwise you cannot actually explore and explore your resources. In the sense that you know, we are in a, in a very small semi-enclosed seas that states cannot have, cannot extend the full maritime entitlement up to, let's say, 200 nautical miles of their exclusive economic zone. Therefore, uh, the limitation is, 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 is necessary, is requisite. And even though we have right now a more clear picture on the law of maritime delimitation, as developed by the National Court of Tribunals, the recent, like, uh, most of the last 10 years, um, we are still, we, there is an elephant in the room, uh, where the elephant in the room is, 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 goes by the name of consent. So very simply, if states parties, if states, you know, uh, parts to a treaty, if states, for example, to the UN Convention of the Sea, if the neighboring states, the Mediterranean Sea, do not consent to any delimitation, there is no way that they can, this, you know, their areas will be, should be, can be exploited. And unilateral actions under international law are not opposable to other states if they're not valid under international law, as the SJ, the Dutch Court of Justice, told us uh, some 70 years ago. Therefore, uh, it is, you know, we need to have the limitation. However, this is very difficult, and um, we saw this, you know, we have seen this with, with the problem with Turkey. So the situation is, is that we, are, we have to look at what we can do, you know, um, prior delimitation or pending delimitation. And now the law here becomes a little bit blarier, I have to say. Um, we, have, we, have, we tend to say that every state has sovereign rights, uh, rights that are akin to sovereignty in, in, uh, in its areas, um, in its continental self or exclusive economic zone, if it declares such, uh, exclusive economic zone. However, in a very recent uh, judgment of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in the Ghana Cote d'Ivoire case, the tribunal went and very, you know, I think very, uh, uh, blandly said that you know uh, the limitation is constitutive of rights, not declaratory. So unless you don't have a, a delimitation agreement, you don't have sovereign rights in dispute maritime areas. A very bold statement and has been already criticized by, by many. That means, however, that you have to have, as the court tribunal went on, you have to have good faith actually claims on an area in order to uh, exercise maritime activities. And this is good faith claims. Good faith is a very abstract term, which cannot be, you know, uh, very generally uh, defined. Therefore, it must be applied in in, in ad hoc situations. I'm I'm sure, as you can all understand, that we are far from good faith efforts in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea uh, right now. So, uh, you know, states, uh, as far as the law is concerned, seems that they are they cannot actually explore and exploit without the limitation of the areas. And also there is an obligation under Article 83, Paragraph 3, and also custom international law, to restrain yourself. You have a duty of restraint uh, in actually uh, in, uh, in exploring and exploiting these kind of areas. And now this, this duty of restraint has been uh, very, again, in this uh, judgment, in other judgments, especially including the very old Aegean Sigonella self case, has been uh, construed as, you know, um, to be very simply, if, you are, if you're doing exploratory drillings and you um, humber, uh, that would mean that you will humber or jeopardize the, uh, the final, uh, uh, by the final uh, the limitation solution. What about the collection of seismic data? Um, when you want to apply for provisional measures before a court of uh, a law and try to stop this, uh, these activities, the tribunals so far on the course have said that you know seismic collection of seismic data are not um, are not creating any irreparable harm or prejudice to the marine environment. It might be you know in violation of sovereign rights and might be needed later on for compensation, but the collection of seismic data seems to be more innocuous rather than when you go to drill uh, unilaterally a certain area. Now uh, others could say, and this is a very arguable uh, you know. Statement that, you know, at the, at the last, uh, end of the day, if you are collecting data and you're acting in good faith, in bad faith, excuse me, then you're actually jeopardizing and harboring the final solution. Therefore, any activities shall be banned and shall be a moratorium of any activities. And this is something which is, I think, you know, it is very, it is a music to ears to many uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean to have a moratorium of this kind of activities that actually jeopardize and also threaten the national security. Final statement, uh, what do you do with the uh, cables and pipelines? 
Now, again, it is uh, under the national law, there is, um, you know, you have a freedom of laying submarine cables and pipelines, the ones that uh, also Kirsten referred to beforehand. Yes, it's true on the high seas, um, also in the exclusive economic zone of third states under Article 58 of the UN Convention of the Sea. But all these all these rights, freedoms are exercised subject to the jurisdiction of the coastal state over its sovereignty, over its uh, uh, colonial self. So Article 79 recognizes of the UNCLOS recognizes the right of all states to lay some cables on pipelines on the continental shelf, not in the territorial sea. Uh, but this is subject to the juris the reasonable measures that the coastal state may take with respect to its own jurisdiction, its own resources, and also for the protection of the environment when it comes to pi pipelines. Therefore, there is still, and also the coastal state may um, may uh, set up the routing or the routing, if you're American, of this of this pipeline over in or in continental shelf. The article, however, does not speak about and delimited continental shelves. Speaks it takes as granted that states have delimited their continental selves. So if you have delimited continental self, which is like Greece and Italy, for example, have done it, or Greece and Egypt now, you can say that you can use Article 79 as the legal basis. What happens in the other part of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, where Turkey and Egypt have not uh, delimited, where Greece and uh, Turkey has not delimited, where Greece and Egypt has not delimited? Therefore, there is a, there is nothing in the nothing in the, uh, the UN Convention of the Sea. My view will be because of found fundamental freedom of the high seas that the regime of the high seas applies. Therefore, all states are still free to del to actually lay some cables on pipelines, subject to their own environmental kind of uh, uh, duties and regulation, having you know as a due diligence obligations. Um, therefore, I think that there is the law might not be seen, seen very clear in this regard, but I think there is room for uh, certain arguments. So to close, um, uh, the, the law is there, the law is to help us, to assist, to be a tool as can also for uh, international relations uh, theorists. Um, with respect to maritime delimitation, it's clear. However, you know, you need to consent to go to delimit the maritime area. No consent, to me, paraphrase George Clooney, no party. Uh, uh, so no consent, no, you cannot do anything, to, in my view, in areas that they are disputed. And uh, uh, Article um, 79, I think, also gives a broad right of a freedom of, of all, all states to lay some more on pipelines. That's all, and, and, and thanks for hearing me, and I'm sorry if I've taken, taken, taken more time as, as, uh, uh, as requested. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. Papastavridis. Now, going back to Professor uh, Tanhum, well, uh, you have given us a very good idea of the state of play in the Mediterranean. I don't think that we have much time, so I will begin uh, with an obvious question. We have three core conflicts uh, taking place, as you have mentioned also in your introductory remark, and the resolution of these conflicts in the region is of an utmost urgency. How feasible is this right now? And what are the limits of influence of the European Union and perhaps of the new US administration uh, to mediate in this conflict? And um, I will leave it there because I've seen that, uh, that you agree with Mr. Westphal on the issue of uh, where the market is exactly right now. Well, yeah, well, uh, I'll answer your question, but as listening to the uh, to my esteemed colleagues, uh, it's nice to see you, Kirsten and Athemios, nice to meet you. Um, I think it's very important for Greeks to look at this from the point of view of the best interest of Greece. Part of the problem, which is kind of implicit, is uh, Eastern Mediterranean gas was seen by the European Union as uh, a replacement for Russian gas. I have a proposal it's going to be published, a policy report, I'm not going to describe it now, where every country in the Eastern Mediterranean can make more money uh, and all the political issues can be left to the side. Now, I hope that interests you enough, but the point is the demand is in the Southern Mediterranean. It is in the Levant and the Maghreb. I've run all the numbers, they're in the report, and it's, it's you know, I listened to uh, a speech by Paul Gagame, the uh, president of Rwanda, and he told the Europeans, he said, the time for adult supervision is over. It's one of the lying economies, and it's the same applies to Greece. Greece needs an adult, adult conversation with the European Union. Greece should be, the lead, is, should be one of the leaders 
for connectivity to where the demand is. Uh, and this is where, uh, which is in the Maghreb. And one of e uh, Greece's key partners for that is Egypt, right? If we think about the Euro-Africa connector, Chris Kirsten talked about um, uh, electricity, which is going to be key. But again, the demand is not going to be in Europe. The demand is going to be in North Africa. So Greece needs to think very carefully about its relationships and it should, it should, the European Union should see Greece as one of its main arteries to interact with Africa and take a different look at Greece because Greece is really one of the gateways. Think of Piraeus, think of, of all the connectivity, uh, think of what the, where the economies are growing. So I, I wanted to introduce that perspective that Greece is actually a key player for energy, for commerce. I don't have to tell you Greece has the largest commercial fleet of the world by far. The UK and China are not even close. So uh, Greece has a big role to play and this mentality should be with, uh, with energy as well. To answer your question, uh, I have uh, in that report that I showed you, there are policy recommendations. These three conflicts need to be resolved concurrently, but separately. They need to be disentangled, but what that means is they have to be progress at the same time so that, um, for example, we're seeing a lot of progress in Libya. So that actually creates more positive momentum for Cyprus and the Greece-Turkey dispute. Uh, if there is progress in Cyprus, it certainly would help the Greece-Turkey conflict. So. Um, so instead of having one of these three areas kind of uh, undermine progress in one place, th there should be processes in place in all three. And uh, Germany is taking a very important role in that. Uh, and behind the scenes is the United States. The whole progress in Libya occurred before because of the United States. As we all know, the withdrawal of the United States from the Eastern Mediterranean uh, allowed a lot of the problems to emerge that the way we have. So uh, a, a re-engaged United States, uh, even if it's working behind the scenes, is a very important part of the picture. Uh, cooperation between the European Union and NATO, the whole transatlantic framework, uh, will be very essential. Uh, but these have to be working all at the same time. And again, this means uh, we have a new European Union where... Britain is out. So again, that means if we're talking about an engine of three and UK is out, that means Italy is in. So now we have a very important relationship between Germany, France, and Italy. Uh, and that relationship between those three will be very important for the East Med. Professor Tanhum, thank you so much. Now going back to Ms. Vespal, well, uh, you have given us um, a sort of idea how Germany positions itself in the East Med, even though it's um, very far away uh, from the region. However, we have seen um, Berlin taking a leading role and trying to mediate, as Mr. Uh, Professor Tanhum just said, um, both in the Libyan conflict and uh, in the current Greek-Turkish uh, crisis, leaving out, however, the Cyprus issue. Uh, has Germany perhaps certain limits of influence in the region and that could explain certain decisions and actions, especially uh, recent decisions and actions um, by Germany? And one second question is whether Germany's approach towards the refugee crisis somehow clouding its strategic analysis of the region. Thank you so much. This is a very, uh, in particular, the second question is a very difficult question for an energy specialist. So I'm, I'm working on global energy markets, so I could only give you the, the view of uh, an interested newspaper reader, but of course, yeah, of course, m migration plays in. Um, and and uh, I would turn it this way that um, this is part of the whole approach of, of thinking about the Mediterranean as, as, as a, um, 
a very important region for EU's prosperity and stability. So that's part of this picture. Um, and and the, the first question is, is a very interesting one. I mean, I think it's an advantage that Germany is far away and not um, closely in, in, involved uh, in, in the processes. And I wouldn't say that Germany leaves Cyprus out. It, it has a strong focus on, on the Cyprus <laughs> issue as well. Um, and of course, you have also have German energy companies in Libya um, having an interest there. So... Um, I, I think still the Germany has a very important role to play as a broker um, and Germany has an, a, a very balancing approach, I would say, and a very realistic approach also to, towards Turkey seeing the major role, of course, for migration, but also um, for um, still this, this, this point of interconnectivity, not only in gas issues, but also in, in the new energies that we're seeing. I, I think really, I, I can only join Michael in saying it, it is a, a phase of defining interconnectivity in a new way in the energy world. And we have very much to understand that we will see very shifting energy geographies. So from, from an energy perspective, the Eastern Met is no longer a, an, a European energy region, but we're really seeing the Middle East coming in. UAE playing a particular role. Israel being really a bridge and a hub very recently for new connections to the, to the Gulf. This is, this is revolutionary and it's a big, big advantage. And I, I really think, uh, and I would really at Israel, I agree with Egypt being really a bridge and a cornerstone for interconnectivities, but also Israel. And, and I think, well, again, I'm an energy specialist and I think it's, it's really very important right now to define the new um, physical interconnectivities, which I think, yes, Europe, Asia interconnector, Europe. Africa interconnector, and I would see it both ways. It's, 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 Europe will also have a demand. If we go for hydrogen, and I think this will be part of the next panel, but I'm a member of the National Hydrogen Council in Germany, and I'm very much, I'm very convinced that, that uh, Greece, um, Spain, Portugal, they, they, they can play a major role in providing capacities for electrolyzers. And then um, this electricity imports play another role, but also, of course, imports of green molecules from, from the Mediterranean. But this is the new energy game. And we still have, of course, traditional energy games playing on, like the one of, of delimitation, sovereignty being an issue. But it, it, I certainly think um, this will require very active and strategic approach by, by the Commission and also Berlin. Thank you so much for your reply. I, even though I have a feeling that I put you in a difficult position and forgetting that you're an energy uh, analyst and not a geopolitical analyst. Thank you so much for this. Now going to uh, Mr. Papastavridis, um, you have mentioned that within um, a, just one year, we have uh, witnessed the signing of two agreements. Uh, in the uh, region of the East Med, uh, aiming to delimitate maritime borders. Um, talking about, as you've mentioned, Greece's agreement with Egypt on the partial delimitation of their exclusive economic zone uh, last August, uh, which challenged, of course, the Libya-Turkey uh, memorandum of November 2019. Um, from a legal point of view, I would like to ask you whether there is an area where uh, the two agreements are coinciding um, and if there is a case that Turkey makes a certain move regarding this area that both agreements are coinciding, uh, whether there are any legal implications and how could Athens respond to this move uh, legally? And a, a third and very short question, are there any legal tools or legal steps that Greece could use or take in the future regarding a possible settlement with a new government in Libya. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Alexander. Uh, too, too, ma too many questions and too difficult questions, I have to say, but uh, very interesting ones, and thanks for, for posing that. Really now, um, <laughs> in, in international law, in, in, in general, treaties bind only, only their parties to them. So the, uh, the Greece-Egypt uh, uh, treaty binds only Greece and Egypt, uh, the Turkish-Libya binds only Turkish and, Turkish, and Turkish and Libya. Therefore, you know, uh, our, our treaty is not opposable, does not have any binding effect on, on Turkey. I mean, our agreement, Greece and, uh, and Egypt agreement, Egyptian agreement, and vice versa, right? So the Turkish Libya accord does not bind us at all. Um, therefore, you know, in, in terms of uh, Turkey coming into this, the area that we have delimited with, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, Egypt is something which the agreement as such does not forbid Turkey, does not ban Turkey to do this. So Turkey can come on the basis of her own agreement with Libya and uh, do some maritime activities in this area. Um, whether this will be uh, uh, prohibited under international law, my argument would be yes, because as I tried to lay out uh, 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 previously, there is an obligation of restraint. So when, because this is a disputed area between Greece and Turkey, Greece uh, considers this is uh, our own sovereign uh, area area that we exercise so many rights. Turkey disputes this and thinks it's its own area based on a very far-fetched um, theory of the effect of violence. Uh, Turkey by very simply thinks that uh, uh, Crete and Rhodes do not, do not have any entitlement to themselves. self. So they have only six nautical miles of the territorial sea, which is by terms of geography, it is a little bit uh, of uh, uh, an absurd, absurd argument. So they, they, will, they will come here based on their own agreement. This will be, you know, any maritime activity will be in violation of international law. Um, what we can do, uh, two things we cannot do. Firstly, you know, we cannot use violence in the sense of uh, sink uh, Uruk's race or other final vessel. This is, uh, um, this, there's only, you know, the only one, the only case, a single case that ever a tribunal, the National Tribunal Court has said that there is a, a, a threat of use of force uh, in, you know, in violation of the UN Charter, has been a similar kind of situation where Guyana was exploring an area and Suriname threatened to actually um, to, um, to sink or to, to, uh, to sink the platform. So this is something we are not permitted to do, to sink any vessel, and we're not permitted to arrest this vessel because it has immunity under the international law. What we can do is actually take other measures under international law. We call this countermeasures, retortion. We can actually, for example, go to European Union Council and ask for sanctions against Turkey. We can go even to Security Council, as we did back in 1976, the UN Security Council. We take other trade measures. So there are other ways that in general, in general international law states often use uh, in order to actually invoke the responsibility of the other state and try to persuade the other state to return to uh, to lawfulness, right? So this is the way that we could, could act. And lastly, the question with respect to Libya, uh, be, Libya has gone twice before the SJ uh, against Malta and against, for Malta and uh, Tunisia. Libya would like, I mean, would like to go with us also the SJ. I don't think any, I don't find any problem of going to the SJ and delimit the area. So with uh, respect to Libya, and we are probably we're going to do this with uh, Albania. So something always recourse to judicial proceedings, something welcome because it will end the dispute. However, uh, you know, the, when we go to the, with the Libya to the, to the ICJ, the tribunal, the ICJ, the Trans Court of Justice will not have jurisdiction to actually invalidate the Turks Libya um, Accord because Turkey will not be a part of the proceedings. So we'll go for our own area, for our uh, overlapping area, but not with respect to the Turkish Libya, because Turkey is a third state, so it cannot be bound by the proceedings uh, by the, of the SJ. I hope I answered your question as, 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 as simply as possible, very, very interesting yet difficult questions. Many thanks. thanks you, you did reply as simple as possible for our audience and within the time limits that I gave you, and that was a tricky exercise by me, and I'm really sorry about that. Yes. Uh, however, I'm, I'm really sorry we're running out of time um, slowly, and I would like to give you back uh, the floor to all three of you for some closing remarks and perhaps some thoughts about uh, the future and uh, what is your take, whether the region could become more volatile and what factors could perhaps uh, make this scenario not possible. 
uh, going back again to Professor Tanhum. So uh, the Turkish Navy did a report which reminded everyone that 87% of Turkey's exports, imports, its trade comes by the sea. Most of that is through the Eastern Mediterranean. So Turkey needs a peaceful Eastern Mediterranean. As I already mentioned, Greece has the largest merchant fleet in the world. Greece needs a peaceful Mediterranean. The Eastern Mediterranean is like a boat. You make a hole in one place, the boat will sink. It doesn't matter where the hole is. So there's an interest. We have to find win-win solutions. Uh, Greece also really needs to take a leadership role. It's an EU member, a NATO member, uh, and it needs to take a bigger role in the Eastern Mediterranean, I think, in a, in a visionary role. As Kirsten and I have been trying to say, the future is a connectivity across the Mediterranean. I tried to lay out, this is the big geopolitical game that France is playing. Italy has its own Italian word for it. They call it il Mediterraneo allagarto, uh, the enlarged Mediterranean. Um, Greece, uh, just to put one, we talked about uh, Egypt. I Italy built a connector to Tunisia from, to take energy from Algeria, to electricity from Algeria. The, 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 the connectors from Israel to Greece uh, and, and Egypt to Greece are larger than Italy's. Egypt right now has 12 gigawatts of surplus electricity to export. Um, again, Egypt and Greece are, the, are, the, are as a, a very fruitful partnership for connectivity uh, through hydrogen, it will be a big generating hydrogen, electric cables, as we know, we're moving to electric cars. Um, so uh, everybody has been very happy that uh, what Microsoft into, uh, has been invested in Greece. Well, that should just be the beginning. Greece needs to think of itself as a, as a tech leader, as an innovation leader. It, is a, it has the geography to play a very important role role. And I think uh, Greece's stand on the rule of law, I think Greece's stand on also combining rule of law with real politique. Uh, together, we can bring a more peaceful and more cooperative uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Professor Talhum, thank you so much. And now going to Ms. Vespal, you have Two minutes. So I'm really sorry about that for your. No, closing. sure, sure. I, I, I would really build on what Michael said. I think that this very valid point with um, Greece playing a leadership role and taking a role in, in this kind of interconnectivity. I, um, I, I also think I would add, as I said before. Um, Israel into the picture, not only Egypt, but also Israel via Cyprus, via Crete, um, into Italy then as well. Um, and just at that, um, of course, there has to be a way to uh, somehow integrate Turkey into the picture because I think it, to me the, the 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 shifting energy dynamics that I try to mention is not just just East Met, but the important region that that I see shifting is into the Black Sea as well, um, and this kind of Southern European region. Oh, to Ukraine, the Black Sea region is also really a, a spot on, and, and this is also something where Europe has to balance with Turkey, um, also the influence of Russia, of course. There's a, the big, broader geopolitical issue is really a very much an issue on, on EU sovereignty, well-being, and, and, and security. And I think Greece really has, a, has to play a role there. Mike. Ms. Westphal, thank you so much. And for underlying the importance of no exclusions in the future. And future solutions need all parties involved in all countries of the region. Um, thank you so much for your comment. And back to you, Mr. Papastavridis, for your closing remark. You have less than two minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, just a, uh, you know, I think like a follow-up of, of, of picking the thread of uh, my previous uh, speakers is uh, 
uh, I think both Michael and Chris said that we should actually, Chris should not be afraid to become like a leader in this in this in this neighborhood. And uh, from our uh, legal point of view, uh, in September something monumental happened. Uh, Greece, for the first time, actually declared a maritime zone. It was the uh, exclusive economic zone following up the partial delimitation with uh, Egypt. So for the first time, we are just one, I think like one of the six only states in the world that didn't have any maritime zones. Greece has a maritime zones. And Greece started, you know, um, having delimitation with uh, uh, Italy. So what I'm always calling for is uh, Greece is, is, is a country that uh, actually is basing, is, is, is founding its, uh, its, its, you know, its foreign policy on international law. So uh, international law is there to exploit it, right? So I think that, uh, you know, we should see more like uh, this kind of uh, steps on, uh, on, on the side of Greece, uh, ex you know, declaring zones, exploring and exploring its possibilities also in the energy field. Uh, that's, it's something that's very welcome. And I think it's, it's, it's the look for to the future. And hopefully that, you know, at the point we'll be ready also to discuss with, with Turkey the bigger picture in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but then we have to do short steps with our now other neighbor countries going to the, the International Court of Justice, uh, doing unilateral acts as, 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 as in accordance with international law and try to explore and exploit our energy resources. That's all. So thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. Well, uh, we thank you, Mr. Papastavridis. Uh, I wish I had more time for more questions because from your replies, I was getting more and more questions to uh, put to our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our audience and you, uh, Professor Mikael Tanhum, Ms. Kirsten Vespal, and Mr. Ephthemios Papastavridis for this first session of the, um, today's event, looking on the energy security and the future perspective of uh, this uh, region, the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you so much all.
Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening uh, again. The discovery of gas uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean Sea has raised high hopes uh, for sources of income in countries such as Egypt, Cyprus, or Israel. But at the same time, extracting gas could be expensive, risk regional stability, while the recent pandemic has definitely slowed down related activities and processes. Um, thus, questions related to renewable energies in the region have also recently surfaced. So this second panel of tonight's conference organized by both Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Athens and Elia Map is focusing on new energy uh, solutions for the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, we have here with us uh, three distinguished speakers. Mr. Nikos Tsafos, uh, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow uh, at the, um, of Energy Security and Climate Ch Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Mr. Tsafos. Uh, Ms. Maria Gavunelli, uh, Associate Professor at the National Capodistrian University of Athens and Senior Policy Advisor of Map in Athens and Mr. Michalis Mathiulakis, Research Associate of Elia Map and Energy Strategy Analyst and Academic Director of the Greek Energy Forum here in Athens. Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I would like to uh, give you the floor first uh, for your introductory uh, remarks. I will begin uh, uh, with Mr. Tsafos. Uh, Mr. Tsafos, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for, for having me and everyone for tuning in. Good afternoon, good evening. Um, I want to talk about the gas discoveries in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I want to ask a very simple question. Uh, what has happened to them? Um, and I want to ask this question, I think, because if you are not uh, an expert or not following the topic on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it is very easy to get the impression that we've discovered all these resources and then the politics got really messy. And if, we'd only, if we could only have a political settlement, wouldn't it be great? And wouldn't it be great to allow us to exploit these resources? That I think is an impression that is out there. And it's also an impression I think is fundamentally wrong. So that's what I wanna talk about. And I really wanna get across four points. One, most of the resources that have been discovered in the East Med in the last 10 years have been developed already. Number two, uh, we actually had more regional connectivity and regional trade between the countries in Egypt, Israel, and Jordan uh, 10 years ago than we do today. Uh, the third point is 10 years ago, the region was a bigger supplier to the world of gas and a bigger supplier to Europe than it was last year. And fourth, uh, there are some remaining resources to be developed. Uh, but the path to develop those resources is very difficult, uh, primarily because of commercial reasons uh, rather than political obstacles. So those are the four points I want to get across. So I'll be sort of very brief. So I want to begin my story in 2009. January 2009 is the first discovery made by Noble Energy of the Tamar field in Israel. It's not really the first discovery. It's the first major discovery. That's when the clock starts for our purposes. Since then, for the next 10 years, we have almost every year uh, one more discovery. We have Leviathan um, in Israel, we have Aphrodite in Cyprus, then we have Sor in Egypt, then we have more discoveries. And so for a 10-year period, we have almost every year a discovery made in either Israel, Cyprus, or Egypt. So I want to review very briefly what happened to those resources and what happened to those countries. So for Egypt, I want to start from there because uh, Egypt uh, had a very big role in the regional market in 2009. So Egypt, uh, at the end of the previous decades, so 2009, was a supplier of LNG and supplied gas by pipeline to Israel, to Jordan, to Syria, and to Lebanon. But for a number of reasons, primarily an unattractive investment environment, its production was flattening out, its consumption was rising, and its exports were becoming smaller and smaller and smaller, until at some point, Egypt became a net importer of gas. Then came Zor in 2015. The development of Zor, very quick, allowed Egypt to turn its fortunes around. And from a net importer, it went back to becoming a net exporter. Nowhere near where it was 10 years ago, but it changed its fortunes. 
that position is probably not sustainable for the very long run, uh, primarily because demand is rising in Egypt, also because most of the fields in Egypt are deep water and they decline very quickly. So you need to be developing continuously more and more resources to keep the production even flat. So for the most part, Egypt is looking at maybe five or 10 years of its ability to be a serious gas exporter. In Israel, at the time of the discovery, Israel was importing gas from Egypt. Uh, because there was less gas to export from Egypt and also because of the Arab Spring, Egypt lost access to Egyptian gas. They had to turn to oil to make up for the shortfall. So for them, the development of the Tamar field was really an enabler for them to achieve energy self-sufficiency or gas self-sufficiency. You had a huge increase in gas consumption. Their coal use went down by almost 50% in the power sector over this period of time. You had cleaner air, you had lower greenhouse gas emissions, and you had some uh, modest exports that really uh, jumped in 2020 uh, towards Jordan uh, and towards Egypt. And for Jordan, we don't usually talk about Jordan very much, but they too were hurt when Egyptian gas went away. They had to turn to oil to make up for the shortfall. And Jordan actually found a solution in LNG. They became an LNG importer to make up for the loss of Egyptian gas supplies. So what that means is that actually the region over the last uh, sort of 10 years has tried to get back to the connectivity that it had in 2009. So what do we have today? Uh, Egypt is supplying gas largely for its own market with some modest LNG exports. Egypt is primarily, uh, Israel is primarily supplying Israel with some modest gas to Jordan, increasing in 2020, and some modest gas supplies to Egypt, also increasing in 2020, but taking some time to ramp up. And what this means is that for the most part, what remains to be developed is the gas in Cyprus. That is the gas that just hasn't really been developed. There's one discovery that has been appraised, Aphrodite, made in 2011. There are two discoveries um, that have been made, Calypso and Glafkos, uh, which the numbers uh, or the resource estimate is still unknown. It hasn't really been appraised and we don't have a de definite number. Those resources are not in a disputed area. They're in the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus. Aphrodite goes a little bit into Israel. Uh, we can leave that aside. Um, but for the most part, uh, uh, Cyprus has been trying to send this gas to Egypt to be re-exported as LNG. These conversations have been ongoing for a long time, uh, the same way that Israeli gas was meant to go to Egypt. Uh, also, these conversations have gone on for a long time. And it hasn't happened, I think, primarily for commercial reasons. To put very simply, um, if you want to sell gas to Egypt and then to export as LNG, you need a high price to make that happen. And you have to agree among the parties about who's going to take on what risk and who's going to make uh, the biggest reward. And those conversations have, have been particularly difficult. And so in today's environment, the real question is, can you get Cypriot gas out? For the most part, it's looking to Egypt. Egypt has not had a huge uh, incentive because it's trying to sell its own gas and it has had trouble selling its own gas. So why take on someone else's gas when you're still trying to get rid of your, your own gas or to commercialize your own gas? So there's a real question mark about the ability of Cyprus to really develop these resources. Um, and there's also some additional gas in Israel. So where we are today is two fields that we know of that have credible potential, Leviathan and Aphrodite, two fields that may have potential but we don't really know in Cyprus, all looking for an outlet primarily targeted at Egypt, much less focused commercially, not politically, much less focused commercially on any pipeline schemes to Turkey or to Greece. Uh, but that's really the question, is at the end of the day, most of the gas that we found has been developed. It has been developed to supply the region. It has enabled an increase in regional connectivity. Again, not as big as it was 10 years ago. As a supplier to the world, it's still a very modest uh, region, much smaller than it was 10 years ago. And there's not that much gas that we have found that we're still trying to figure out what to do with. And so I think that is something that is important to understand as we think about the future of energy in the region, but also the future of politics and geopolitics in the region. So I'll stop there. Excellent remarks, uh, Mr. Tafos, and you give us a very good idea of, of that would have been uh, that would have been a rational question of anyone uh, watching developments in the East Med 
what about the resources uh, that the area uh, is given? And you give us, uh, and you have just gave us a very good and clear picture. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm no, now going to Professor Gabunelli for her introductory uh, remarks. Uh, good evening, Professor. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be with you uh, today. It's always a pleasure to be around the Eliamep and having the conference at the Nash Stiftung is an additional uh, bonus. Um, I followed up on uh, uh, Mr. Tafos and I, I really feel that we are completely complementary because, of course, the next question is, is there only this type of energy production in the East Med or should it be the only type of uh, energy production? Today, we focus on this discussion in the European Council in Brussels, and we tend to forget that in addition to Turkey and East Med and all problems uh, and worries about that, there is also a discussion about a significant part of the budget going to the, green, to the European Green Deal. And the European Green Deal, of course, is the way in which our European uh, countries um, would react to the need to uh, uh, figure out what we're going to do about climate change. Uh, there is a commitment on our part uh, that we are moving towards a very substantial cut on emissions and uh, the European Parliament is talking about 60%. The discussion today is about 55% reduction. These are huge numbers. How come are they going to happen if we keep relying on, on, on uh, oil and gas and coal and whatnot? So quite clearly, we need to do something uh, in addition to that or instead of that. Uh, there's an, a second question that is really very, very uh, clear, especially in the Mediterranean context. Um, for any one of us who has flown over northern countries, uh, over, over uh, Denmark or the UK or the Netherlands, the very first thing you, that you see across uh, along the, 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 the coastline is really endless rows of wind farms, um, uh, energy resources that come from the wind um, there's no such thing in the Mediterranean. What is missing? The sea, the wind, or the sun for solar energy? There's clearly something very, very wrong. Very wrong. And I think that uh, if we're talking about uh, diversification of energy, if we're talking about different sources of energy, if we're talking at the end of the day about energy security for Europe and not only, Europe and the wider area in the Mediterranean, uh, then clearly we need to tap on these resources which have been totally and completely set aside for the time being. There are literally no wind farms uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean at sea. Nothing, not one. It's ridiculous to even contemplate that. Uh, why is that? There are two reasons, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, both Mr. Tafos and Mr. Matthew Dykes uh, would follow up on that. One reason was, first and f in the beginning, uh, questions of um, technology and, of course, the question of, of the commercial exploitation of these situations. Uh, we needed, uh, the, the cost was quite substantial, but it is going down quite substantially. Um, and uh, there is also an additional um, element, infrastructure. Uh, let me remind you that uh, we have not interconnected our major islands. We just started the intercorrection of Crete, which is absurd in this country. Uh, we have been extremely late in doing elementary things, things that we should have done uh, 20 years ago. But we started, which is, you know, always good uh, to follow up. Uh, you cannot have an offshore wind farm without interconnection. You need cables. You need cables to just bring in to the mainland um, the, the, the electricity that you're going to, to produce. Um, and you also need storage uh, facilities, something to put in this excess electricity. Um, uh, Germany, who has, uh, which has an amazing capacity to produce um, electricity from wind farms, uh, had at times to switch off the system, especially when uh, the winds were particularly high, 
simply because they could not cope with the increase in production uh, without actually uh, running the risk of, of having abs absolutely everything fried up. So you realize, of course, that in these circumstances, technology needs to be upgraded. And it seems that the technology is being up upgraded for the time being commercial. Uh, the, the cost for goes down. Instead of having, uh, I don't know how many um, wind, uh, wind um, uh, uh, units, installations separately, you can have bigger units that could actually produce more. Uh, which is uh, uh, commercially exploitable directly. Uh, so uh, there seems to be uh, a number of issues that are developing in the right way. The second element, of course, uh, which is very closely interrelated to the first one, is exactly the fact that uh, you cannot have just a single installation uh, in the same way as you have a, uh, an oil platform. And that's the end of it. You can have a single oil platform, and we do have a single oil platform uh, off the island of Thassos at Prinos, and we do produce from it. But you cannot have a single wind installation and start producing commercially, isn't it? So you need multiple uh, numbers of these things. And of course, these multiple numbers do not, cannot be uh, uh, put in the, same in the same place, in the same location. They need to to expand, you know, you need a wind farm. Uh, and in order to do that, you need space. Uh, and we're talking about the Mediterranean, one of the most crowded seas in the world, because we have navigation. Um, we have uh, human activities, left, right, and center. We have tourism. We have just about everything under the sun. So what are you going to do? And in addition to that, uh, and, and Dr. Papastavridis has actually referred to that earlier. In addition to that, we are running out of space. Why? Because we have not delimited our space. So somehow we turn back to the fundamental question. To whom would this particular bit of, of sea in this type, in the, and, and seabed uh, belong to? Uh, so you really need to make sure that you have all your uh, maritime zones clearly defined and therefore delimited so that you may have a single focal point of jurisdiction so that you know with whom you are going to talk and what kind of permits you are going to uh, require and to whom you are going to pay taxes or whatnot. Hmm? Uh, because all these things are huge investments. Nobody is going to throw money into the sea. It is quite clear. Uh, there is uh, an obligation under EU law that actually uh, pushes us in this direction, and that is the obligation to come up with marine spatial planning by uh, March uh, 2021. It's very clear that we're not going to, to do it you know, during that period. Uh, but clearly, the idea here is that we're going to make sure that we have specific uses uh, assigned to specific areas offshore, so that people would know where you can actually go and build a hotel and have tourism, or where you can go fishing, or where you can actually have a wind farm, uh, or even, or even uh, a wave energy installation. We have two of those uh, on a fairly experimental phase uh, lying about in the Aegean. Um, the uh, marine uh, spatial planning obligation, however, again requires that you are very, very clear about your maritime zones. So back to the drawing board and back to the discussion about delimitation. Um, we now have, since the 2nd of September, we now have our very first EZ, the EZ between Greece and Egypt, um, which means that for the very first time, with the additional agreement uh, with Italy, but the Italy agreement has not been um, uh, brought uh, into force as yet. We, we, we need to have um, presidential decrees issued on both sides, actually, both the Italians and ourselves. So the one e uh, EZ that we do have right now is the one with Egypt. That really gives us space, space to move on space that would actually fall again under the um, uh, agreement or the memorandum of understanding between 
Turkey and Libya. So all over again, let's go back to the beginning. We need to resolve the issues so that we can actually move ahead. That does not uh, prevent us, and that's actually my last word. Um, uh, that does not prevent us in, in, in uh, moving into areas that are not that disputed or in, in uh, uh, proceeding with marine spatial planning in uh, the Ionian Sea or in parts of the Aegean and, and starting these kind of uh, operations there, that would be to the benefit of our obligations under the climate change um, uh, system and our obligations uh, and our common sense approach, actually, uh, to energy security. Thank you so much. Well, Professor Mabonelli, thank you for your remarks. You have given us a full idea and perhaps you have stolen from me some questions. <laughs> but I'm moving now to Mr. Matthewlakis. Uh, Mr. Matthewlakis, please um, just give us uh, as brief as possible your introductory remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Fuduri, and thank you to LMAP and uh, CAS for the invitation. Um, well, there's a benefit and a problem when you're the last speaker of... Uh, in a, in a panel and the whole session, it's, the benefit is that you get to hear all these interesting uh, um, points from all the uh, other speakers. So the problem is that you want to comment, I want to comment on them, and uh, I wouldn't have the time to do that. I will, however, um, have you a very short... You will have time, don't worry. I will okay. make sure that you will have time to comment. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and prioritize. Uh, before I start with whatever I'd like to say, I, I would like to make a very fast comment in the previous... Um, session there was an elaborate and very interesting talk about uh, the cooperation the possibility of cooperation between greece and turkey and uh, cyprus and uh, the whole region uh, uh, my background besides economic finance is international relations uh, and energy and uh, i cannot help myself but being uh, from the side of political realism turkey is a revisionist state when you have a revisionist state you there is very little room for cooperation Everything else sounds very nice and it's very hopeful, but when you have a state that is not content with their current status and they want to change it, uh, cooperation does not fall under normal uh, procedure. So this is more wishful thinking than uh, reality about what can happen. That was a parenthesis. I'm going to move on with um, uh, my part regarding energy security. I mean, the overall theme here is energy security in uh, Eastern Mediterranean and the new energy uh, solutions. I have to start by saying that uh, Eastern Mediterranean is a regional subsystem and as any regional subsystem is bound to be affected uh, by various layers and the, the, la the, the bottom layer, the basic layer is uh, the system it belongs to. So we're talking about what is Eastern Mediterranean energy affected by. Primarily it is affected by three drivers. The first one is the competition between the United States and China that through the Silk Road has reached uh, our area and is influencing also energy uh, relations of all the countries involved. The second is the sale, gas and oil revolution in the United States that is directly affecting um, Russian interests in our area, in all of Europe and in the subsystem of uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and this uh, competition, since the United States can now hit some uh, um, very vital Russian interests, this affects everything in our area. The third, which is equally a uh, big driver, is um, the effort to mitigate and fight climate change, and uh, therefore all the need to promote cleaner forms of energy, compared to the old uh, energy. These three drivers are influencing Europe in general, and of course, Eastern Mediterranean and Southeastern Europe, these systems are always interconnected. Taking that uh, into consideration, we have to see how each of these drivers, uh, how they're influencing the area. I'll start the other way around with the third one, um, the effort to fight climate change uh, this has been evident very strongly in European Union energy policy. The big difference being uh, last year, 2019, with the change of the Commission, where basically the primary uh, 
policy of the energy union has switched to the European Green Deal. Um, now, the European Green Deal has been a policy that has derived from the energy union policy, but the major difference is that the energy union policy, which was from the previous commission, their flagship, if I may say, was energy security. It was about securing uh, energy sources to the European Union with affordable prices, creating uh, the markets and the conditions for the markets to function. There was, while this is still at play, and then among these things was also, of course, uh, climate change and uh, promoting renewables. Now, the new commission with the European Green Deal, of course, has kept all the previous, but it has switched. There was a shift in the focus where climate change has gone up uh, in the ranks and uh, energy security uh, has gone further down. Now, the big question there is, is energy security and the fight against climate, are they colliding or can, are cooperative policies? And this should be an easy answer. The easy answer, the nice answer would be that these two are uh, collaborating policies and everybody would be happy, but unfortunately very often they are colliding. And uh, we had the privilege of having some uh, uh, speakers from Germany before, earlier. Um, Germany is a very good example of how uh, these two things might not actually work so well together. And I will come down to the to Eastern Mediterranean in the um, following that uh, logic. So Germany, after the Fukushima accident in, in Japan, they made a decision to completely stop uh, another form of energy, nuclear energy. So they wanted to uh, decommission and uh, they moved over with decommissioning all the nuclear uh, plants, hoping that uh, renewables will come and uh, fill the, the gap. Renewables, however, are not still in the position to fill the gap. This has led to uh, Germany being much more exposed to uh, gas imports in order to fill the gap. And this has made Germany more susceptible to Russian influence. We have seen these things influencing German policy when it comes to the pipelines, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline and other policies in uh, regarding Russia. And in international relations, the basic thing about uh, political power in the international system is, about, is has to do with the freedom of movement. When you cannot freely move in the system, when you cannot uh, perform your foreign policy without having to think and being bonded by relations with others, then there's a problem. And Germany has had that because they moved away from uh, nuclear. Now, there has been a lot of talk, and I heard it also in the previous panel about uh, the future of gas, that gas is, is, uh, seems like it's um, um, a, a fuel of the past, and now we have renewables and everything will go uh, as we please, and therefore investments move this way, which is true. Investments in the European Union move towards renewables, and it's also true that uh, Eastern Mediterranean has been left behind in this department. There is great potential there that we haven't taken advantage of. However, we are speeding, or I'm, I'm afraid that we are speeding um, towards a destination without having a safety net. Renewables can function perfectly so far in the European system because they are in relatively low levels. Today and tomorrow, one of the things that we, is discussed in the um, um, European Council meeting is raising these levels. The thing is that since we don't have yet effective ways to store energy massively, we have a problem. The more energy comes from renewables, the more unstable the system is. And when we're talking about energy security, and I remind that this is the main issue here. Energy security means reliable uh, supply of energy. So right now, we cannot say at this moment and with the technology that we have in our hands for the next few decades, because there's always the possibility of a surprise new development. But however, the way we are now, we cannot move fast uh, with renewables unless we have a transitional fuel, transitional fuel that can that can has the, that can have the flexibility to support extended renewables is gas. That's one thing for gas. And then the second thing that we need 
to take into consideration is, like I said earlier, the other two major drivers, which is the United States going into the sale gas revolution and the competition with Russia. And the third one, uh, the US competition with China. This means that for the United States, it's imperative to have gas markets functioning properly and better all over the world. And this cannot be ignored. We can say all we need about how much better it would be if we had only renewables, but this will not be ignored. It's not good or bad, it is what it is. And the same thing goes with Russia and the way they are developing natural gas. And the same thing goes with the competition with China. China and the Silk Road has reached the source of Europe, Greece and uh, Cyprus actually. There are also countries who are uh, first taking this impact and United States has to stop this. And energy is a tool to, to, to counteract this um, invasion, if we say, if, let me say, from China. And the Eastern Mediterranean is a tool to do this. So whatever the findings are, are from Eastern Mediterranean, I have to say that besides Cyprus, there's also still Greece that has a potential for gas. And all the circumstances show that there's still a large transitional period where we have to consider everything. And when it comes to energy security, we have to uh, accept the fact that we will live for the next two or three decades with all fuels at play. And these have to be combined in a way that it will benefit everybody's, first of all, everybody's political, national interests, and therefore uh, their energy interests that can function as a tool for the political interest. This is also, and I will finish with this, this is also um, a common um, misunderstanding that we have when we talk about energy and uh, uh, geopolitics. I have the benefit to have studies and experience from both sides, plus uh, the finance. So I, I, can, I can say that uh, clearly, um, when it comes to the question, hardly anybody asks whether energy policy is a tool for national and security policy or national security policy is a tool for energy policy, there's only one question. Energy policies of all the states is one more tool for national and security policies. We tend in Europe and in Greece to blend this and think that the, it's the other way around and we need to mobilize our um, foreign policy, our security policy to promote energy. This is not it. All countries have all the tools, including energy, to promote national interests. We need to keep that in mind to always see the big picture and take our decisions. So. Well, uh, Mr. Makulakis, thank you so much. Uh, you're giving us a very good and clear picture, and I will definitely agree with the fact uh, with what you just mentioned that energy policies are indeed a tool for uh, national uh, securities as well. Now, going back to Mr. Nikos uh, Tsafos, um, during the pandemic, Mr. Tsafos, a lot has substantially changed, even the interest of companies like ExxonMobil in the region. On the other hand, uh, this same pandemic is perhaps putting further pressure on the energy transition globally, and that includes, of course, the East Med region. How might government policies in response to COVID-19 accelerate or slow down the transition? Thank you so much. Well, thank you for that question. That's, I think, one of the hardest questions that we're trying to grapple with today. So let me tell you what I think we know so far. I think we know that COVID-19 was a big shock to the system, but unless we have different policies, uh, we, we will just eventually go back to the same trajectory that we had before. Um, you know, one of the things we do at the Center for Strategic and International Studies is we host a lot of outlooks we had BP, we had Bloomberg NEF. Um, last week, come and present the International Energy Agency has shown the same thing. And, and they all show this, which is COVID goes down, and then you go back to the exact same line that you had before. That it's a shock, but it doesn't change the trajectory. Government policy is one of the main instruments for changing that trajectory. So here's what we've seen. We've seen governments spend upward of $12 trillion 
to try to support their economies globally in response to the pandemic. But governments have mostly spent money to support the existing system. Uh, and that means supporting the existing energy system. Money has gone to airlines and public transportation and auto companies. Uh, they've tried to essentially support what existed before. So most of this money is not really being directed in a way that accelerates the transition. What we are seeing though is a parallel trend and that is governments around the world led by Europe articulating a vision for how the energy transition should play out and more importantly, being willing to commit resources to support that ambition. So obviously the European Union is at the forefront of that, but we also see individual countries in Europe articulate uh, ambitious strategies, Germany, France, the UK, you know, the prime minister talked about a green industrial revolution uh, and identifying specific sectors like hydrogen, urban mobility, electric vehicles, electric charging infrastructure, um, things like that, offshore wind. Uh, each country kind of has its own uh, select areas that it is investing in. We're also seeing countries outside of Europe, obviously Japan and Korea articulating 2050 greenhouse gas emissions targets, China coming up with a 2060 carbon neutrality goal. Um, much less detail from those places in terms of how they're going to uh, meet these targets. And of course, we're all waiting very patiently for January 20th, 2021, uh, to see what will come out of the new uh, Biden administration and, and what kind of strategy uh, President elect Biden is going to put. So I think that the message here is the most, the most striking thing for me has been that we've talked about climate change for a long time as an insurance, as a risk prevention, or as a as a damage prevention system, that we have this big threat, we have to do something, otherwise we're gonna get hit very hard. And I think what's really changing for the last six months and maybe a little bit less, is countries are seeing a huge opportunity. Someone's gonna to have to build all this stuff. Uh, someone's gonna to have to build all the turbines and the cars and the uh, hydrogen and the new pipelines maybe, and someone's gonna to have to retrofit all the houses of the world and build heat pumps and, and all that. And, and countries are seeing that, they want to be ahead of this, which is why I think the European Union talks about, uh, you know, the Green Deal in the context or explicitly stated as an industrial policy, right, as an industrial strategy. It's not just a climate strategy, it's an industrial strategy. And so I think the question for this region, and again, I'm always very careful when we talk about this region, if you ask me what I think about Greece or what I think about Turkey or what I think about Cyprus or Israel or Jordan or Egypt, I'll give you different answers depending on who we're talking about. But the question is, you know, how do you hook yourself to this meta trend? How do you find the opportunities that are presented from this transition? And how do you also safeguard your security? I, I totally uh, subscribe to the point that, you know, if you, if you do things too quickly or if you do things incorrectly, uh, you can get hurt. You can have a, adverse consequences. I mean, look at California, where the stability of the power system um, was really jeopardized for a number of reasons. I don't want to oversimplify this, but one of the reasons, one of many, was that they shut down gas-fired power plants very quickly. Um, again, it wasn't the only thing. They had record level demand, drought, and other things. So you have to manage this properly from an energy security perspective, but there's a huge opportunity. And so the question I think for the region is, you don't, you have found resources. So like Israel now is you know, self-sufficient. You're not gonna throw the gas away. Like you, you wanna develop the resource that you have. But finding that balance of how do you develop the old hydrocarbons, but also have an eye for the future. And I think, and I'll close with this statement, if I think there is one of the biggest criticism of the Trump administration in the United States is that they, didn't, they weren't really able to do both. They swung so much towards hydrocarbons that they sort of neglected to take care and to nurture the new industries of the future, right? And so that I think is the challenge that exists for all countries. And it's especially the challenge for hydrocarbon rich countries or countries that have hydrocarbons is how do you manage both? How do you develop what you have in a way that makes sense for you, but not in a way that undermines your ability to compete in the future? Mr. Tafos, thank you uh, so much uh, for this. Um, now, going back to uh, Professor uh, Gabunelli, um, as you 
all mentioned, not just you, Professor, um, um, about the Green Deal. Uh, a few weeks ago, I have to remind the audience here and you that the European Commission, within the framework of this uh, Green Deal, uh, announced its new strategy, which defines wind energy, in fact, as the most important source of uh, electricity production. Um, one very um, short question, and I would ask you to be briefly in your replies, what are the geopolitical advantages of the, uh, of, for the East Med region? And what could be the legal implications of any related projects? Is the construction or the operation, for instance, of maritime wind parks feasible in non-delineated waters? Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I have partly answered your question. You were right when you mentioned that earlier. Um, it has already been said, and Mr. Tafos has reiterated that, that we're in a, in a, 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 at an era of transition. And of course, when you have, where you're transiting from one stable situation to another stable situation, you are by definition unstable. So how can you possibly talk about security when you, you, you don't really know where you are exactly? The fact that the European Union is talking about wind power is simply because there is already enormous investment in wind power. And so among the different alternative sources of energy, this is the one that we are most familiar with. This and solar energy is actually uh, moving in those two. But wind energy is extremely important because uh, we do know up to some extent how we're going to, to, to work with it. Uh, it is very, very clear that as we're moving from one source of energy to another, uh, Mr. Matthew Lakis is absolutely right. We need to coexist for the time being which means that uh, we need to be investing into new uh, installations, into new technology. And it is indeed a challenge for the future. It is indeed uh, an obvious source of uh, prosperity. At the same time, it is a risk. So who is going to go and invest huge quantities of money in an area that is not clearly delimited, where you really do not know uh, to whom you are talking to. Because at the end of the day, the idea of delimitation is simply the idea of knowing who is your interlocutor. Uh, I would see more and more um, uh, exploration and exploitation, more and more development, more and more investment in areas that are coastal areas, very close to the land. Why? Because it is simply more secure to be there. You do know where you are. On the other hand, in these areas, you do have a number of contradictory uses or, uh, or uh, conflicting uses of the seas. And you need to take that into consideration. The further you move away from the shore, uh, the easier it is perhaps to uh, reconcile these, these uses, but the further away you go from the shore, uh, that much more difficult it becomes uh, to defend uh, your, your investment uh, and make sure uh, that whatever it is that you are putting there would last. Last point, and I, I finish with that. Uh, we're talking about long-term investments. We're not talking about something that you would uh, just run for five years, get your money and off you go. Uh, all energy investments have actually uh, a prospect of 20, 25, 30, even 50 years. So that really means that you need to take a long-term approach. And if you are in, the, in this area uh, of transition for 20, 25 years, then clearly the risk becomes even greater. And you need to take that into consideration as well. Um, bottom line, without really starting from a secure point, the most secure possible, you cannot end up uh, with, with a, a secure uh, end. So uh, you have to struggle uh, in, in an area or, or with shifting sounds up to a certain extent, and you have to make do. Uh, it's, uh, nobody said that it's actually easy. Thank you. 
Well, we thank you, Professor. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Mathiulakis, I would like to ask you, I would really, really wanted to ask you too many questions, but now I well, will have to uh, limit myself in just one about the role of um, uh, hydrogen, especially for the East Med's energy security. Yes. Um, well, actually, um, hydrogen is, in my opinion, one of the solutions um, for this transitional period. First of all, um, in the issue which is very important, uh, and I was very happy to hear uh, Professor Gravonelli say it, um, why don't we have more renewables in, in Eastern Mediterranean? Uh, I believe the major um, issue is that um, hydrocar hydrocarbons are primarily controlled by the government, and it's easier for the big companies to make uh, deals with the governments. When it comes to renewables, the companies are smaller, each project is smaller, and your companies are more susceptible to the situation in its country. The governments, on the other hand, they don't have the same control that they would like to have. And that means that the companies on the other side, they need better investment environment, more secure investment environment in order to proceed with the investments. While it's not the same, you can afford to be more risky when it we're talking about big, uh, big gas or petrol uh, companies. So um, this is a thing, a reason. Otherwise, I and going back to um, to hydrogen, I think this is a very uh, promising solution to combine what we have and what we can do. And this can be combined in two ways. First of all, um, talking about talking about green hydrogen. So electrolysis from uh, renewables to produce hydrogen, this is the best way to actually also solve the issue of um, um, storage of energy. So power to gas basically, and this way we solve a lot of problems at the same time. The, there's a great wind and solar potential in the Eastern Mediterranean. There is uh, plenty of water. Things, um, there's a big issue regarding uh, hydrogen about how much water you need and whether you need it you need only fresh water there has been a lot of whoever is against hydrogen they say that there's a lot of need for fresh water this is not the case technologies now you can use desalination so you can use water from uh, from the sea also from wastewater so actually the the concept of having renewables uh, in coastal areas and this way produce hydrogen and from this, use it as a fuel or use it to store energy and solve the whole circle. This is ideal. And the Eastern Mediterranean could do this. The problem would be what I mentioned earlier about um, stability in the investing environment. If we're talking about Cyprus, um, things are better. But if we talk about in, in Israel, but if we talk about Egypt and other countries, things might be a little bit more shaky. So it's a little bit more difficult. But... Uh, I think hydrogen has a great potential. And I'll just put a small parenthesis before I finish. To combine it all, blue hydrogen, so hydrogen produced by natural gas with CO2 capture. So because without it, then we're talking about brown. It's a whole different story. But blue hydrogen could give the economies of scale needed in the beginning to boost the whole hydrogen uh, infrastructure and technology and end up eventually only with green hydrogen, which anyway, um, Eastern Mediterranean could use by utilizing much more renewables. So. Mr. Marfilaki, thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank you, to thank all of you. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time, but I think we gave, um, we all gave a very good account and a fair analysis on the future, actually, of energy security for the Eastern Mediterranean. I would like to also thank our audience and personally now Mr. Tsafos, uh, Ms. Maria uh, Gavonelli and Mr. Michalis Mathiulakis for the second uh, session of the event, online conference or, or co-organized by uh, Conrad and our Stiftung here in Athens and of course uh, Elia Met. Uh, thank you all and uh, have a very nice rest of the evening. Have a good evening everyone. Thank you.